All right, so we've looked at atomic structure and symbolism, really the structure of the elements, if we're talking about pure elements. And we've looked at chemical formulas, which tell us about compound structure, the structures of compounds, be they molecular or ionic. Now we're going to look at how the elements are organized and some really deep patterns in the properties of the elements as manifested on the periodic table. The properties of the elements vary periodically, and this was really Mendeleev's great insight when he first formulated the periodic table, an insight really that uh, was, had been building over the years and really culminated in Mendeleev's organization of the periodic table and his publication of the idea. When we say the elements' properties vary periodically, though, what exactly do we mean? Well, I, I want to give you two examples on this slide of what we mean by the properties of the elements vary periodically. So first, let's take a look at this graph. What we've done, and actually this is true of both of these graphs, is place the atomic number on the x-axis. So remember that this is just the number of protons in the nucleus, and it really defines the element. So going from left to right, we're going from the kind of smallest elements with the lightest nuclei to the heaviest elements on the right with the heaviest nuclei. And we're looking at different properties as we progress from light elements to heavy elements. The first is the atomic radius. So how big essentially is the atom? When we say that the properties vary periodically, if we ignore the fact that the chunks are kind of moving up, we can absolutely see chunks in this graph where the same trend is observed across the chunk. So for example, we've got kind of a, a downward trend within these chunks that I've kind of divided off. And that trend repeats itself. And that's what we mean by periodic. This downward trend across a series of elements repeats itself periodically. There's also a trend, if we look at each of the chunks, in each of the oscillations moving upward. So we can compare, for example, this first downward trend to the second, to the third, to the fourth. And we can see that there's a general movement upward here. And I'm actually going to change colors uh, to indicate that in a different color, just because it's, it's different, really, from the oscillations that we're seeing. There's a shift upward as we move kind of to a, a different series of, of elements. And both of these, really, we refer to as periodic trends. So we can define periodic trends as really regular variations in the properties of the elements. And by regular, we mean oscillating and potentially moving up and down across these oscillations. And it's always as a function of atomic number. And so any graph of atomic properties with the atomic number on the x-axis is likely to show these oscillations. The second graph looks at the ionization energy. And this is a measure of the tendency of the atom or the energetics involved in kicking an electron out of an atom. So just briefly to touch on this, let's say we started with an atom A in the gas phase and we hit it with some energy through some means. Maybe we heated the crap out of it. This can result in the ejection of an electron from the atom. Electrons are negative, so that's going to leave us with a cation and an ejected electron. And the energetics of this situation, how much energy is required to kick off an electron from the atom, is what we call the ionization energy. And that's listed here on the left-hand side of the graph. So it's the x-axis. If we again take a, a long, hard look at this graph, we'll notice that there are oscillations in this graph as well. They're perhaps a, a little bit more subtle than they were in the first graph. But again, if we section off this graph, we'll see that there's an upward trend moving across a series of elements of increasing atomic number within each of these chunks. So let's point that out with arrows. So there's absolutely an upward trend here, 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 
And here, qualitatively, even though there are some exceptions, we can say more or less that there is an upward trend in ionization energy as we move left to right or from lower to higher atomic number or uh, from lighter to heavier elements in terms of number of protons in the nucleus. But like we saw with the atomic radius trend, there's also an apparent trend across the different series. And so we're going from higher to lower if we look at where each of those kind of upward pointing chunks is positioned across the entire graph. So there's a downward trend if we kind of chunk the upward uh, pointing. So there appears to be a downward trend overall in ionization energy with regular upward variations across series within the elements. The last thing worth mentioning here in, with periodicity and something that was key to Mendeleev's discovery is that the chemical reactivity of the elements also displays periodicity. Elements that correspond within these chunks. So, you know, for example, we could identify, you know, maybe an element right here that is the sixth element in this series. The sixth element in this series, which is right here, is likely to display analogous reactivity. These elements can be grouped together conceptually based on their similarities and reactivity that we can absolutely observe. And it was Mendeleev's observations and the observations of other chemists in the 19th century that really gave rise to the idea of periodicity before we had the ability to measure atomic radius and ionization energy and things like this. It was the periodic trends in chemical reactivity, the numbers and types of compounds formed, how different elements combine together and things like this, that really gave rise to what's called the periodic law initially. Now, where all this is going, of course, is in the organization of the elements into the periodic table. And here is the periodic table in all of its glory. Going back to the graphs, we made this distinction between a series of elements in which a, a set trend is observed and the different chunks of these series. On the periodic table, that difference, I think, becomes a little more clear. A series in which a consistent trend is observed with increasing atomic number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, is referred to as a period. So we can talk about period 1, for example, or the first period or the first row, hydrogen and helium, period 2, period 3, period 4. These are the periods of the oscillations is, is the reason they're called periods, right? Goes up, comes down, that's a period. And we observe those trends moving left to right across the periodic table like this. It's also beneficial though to think about the columns of the periodic table, realizing that elements within a column, common column are analogous. Going again back up here we, where we looked at the sixth element which in, within each of these chunks, these two elements would show up on the periodic table next to each other vertically. So they would show up in what we call the same group. So for example, carbon is in group 14. Silicon is also in group 14, and carbon and silicon display analogous reactivity and properties within periodic trends. For example, carbon forms four bonds, and silicon is also capable of forming four bonds. Nitrogen is in group 15, oxygen in group 16, etc. So this period group distinction is really important to keep in mind with the periodic table. Elements within the same group are analogous. And across a period, we observe a consistent trend in atomic level properties like atomic radii or ionization energy. Now, we can also look at the periodic table from kind of a broader view and realize that very large chunks of the elements behave in similar ways. And that's what's done with the color coding on this table. So let's highlight that and, and talk about that a little bit. So one thing we can notice is that the vast majority of elements on the left-hand side of the periodic table, hydrogen being an important exception, are metals. The metals are highlighted in, in yellow on this table. And there's kind of a stair-step division 
between the metals and what we call the metalloids on the periodic table. So on the right hand side of the periodic table we have elements that behave like metals in some ways but not in others. Boron, silicon, germanium. For example, they're not great at conducting electricity but they can conduct electricity as metals would. And these are what we refer to as the metalloids. On the right hand side of the periodic table we have the nonmetals, and these tend to be either gases, liquids, and these tend to be either gases or liquids in their elemental state. You'll see that based on the way the, the element symbols are highlighted here, bromine and mercury being the most famous liquids at room temperature on the periodic table. Um, and they also uh, bond to each other in different ways than the metals. And so this metal-nonmetal distinction is critical to keep in mind in the periodic table. The vast majority of elements on the left are metals, on the right, nonmetals. The metalloids display reactivity and properties that are intermediate between metals and nonmetals, behaving in some contexts more like metals and some more like nonmetals. And really, how they behave depends in a, in a complex way on the context, which you may see in, in more detail in future chemistry courses, but we won't get into those details here. Many of the groups on the periodic table have dedicated names. And so, you know, talking about groups strictly as a column of elements on the periodic table, many columns have specific names that chemists use to refer to them. So group one, for example, is the alkali metals. These are things like lithium, potassium, sodium. The alkaline earth metals, magnesium, calcium, etc., are group two. I'm actually going to jump over to group 13 doesn't really have a name. Group 14 doesn't really have a name either. You'll sometimes hear these referred to as the boron group and the carbon group, since boron and carbon show up at the top of these series. Group 15 is sometimes called the nictogens. That's not super common. The nitrogen group is also used. The oxygen group is the chalcogens. And then very common, group 17 is referred to as the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, etc. And then group 18, which starts with neon, well, okay, really starts with helium in the second row, are called the noble gases. Everything that you see here in green is called the main group. The main group elements really follow periodic trends in a robust way, a very robust way. And so we kind of set them apart from the other elements in the periodic table, which in some cases are exceptions to the periodic law. Between the alkaline earth metals and group 13, we have a large block of elements called the transition metals. And the word transition evokes the idea that these elements have properties that are kind of intermediate between the alkaline earth metals and the group 13 elements, which actually split metals, nonmetals, and, and metalloids, actually. So nonmetals at the top, metalloids in the middle, and uh, metals at the bottom. And because of that transitionary nature of the transition metals, their properties are, are sometimes difficult to predict. To complicate the situation even further, within the transition metals, we have groups that pop out called the lanthanides and actinides, which are elements that really on, on some level, even though they're laid out horizontally, behave like a group with very similar properties to each other. The reason for this structure has to do with the quantum structure of the atoms um, of the elements, uh, which we may or may not get into later. Uh, for the time being, though, it's just worth noting that some groups on the periodic table have dedicated names, and these are commonly used instead of the group numbers, although using the group numbers for our purposes, is, if you need to name a group, for example, is totally fine. 